the workshop, but okay. I'll just keep going into it. We're ready. Yeah, I think uh, we've got all of our presenters here at least and good chair of attendees. So let's see. Hey, welcome and thank thank you to everyone for attending today's NACO workshop. The topic of today's workshop is best practices for renewable energy development from a county perspective. As I'm sure everyone is aware, Nevada has become a sort of epicenter for renewable energy projects and speculation. Today's panel will focus mostly on utility scale solar projects with the goal of providing a thorough overview of the project permitting process, as well as providing some guidance in how Counties can get involved and make sure their projects don't negatively impact county budgets. Your thing is going to ruin my screen. Well, my oh, the Zoom. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as well as providing some guidance on how to how counties can get involved to make sure the projects don't negatively impact county budgets and are, are an overall net benefit to their local communities. My name is Scott Keller. I currently serve on the Lyon County Board of County Commissioners. Early on, I recognized that my county was not prepared for the sudden growth in the industry. After attending the National NACO Legislative Conference in Washington, D.C. and the National NACO Conference in Austin, Texas, it became evident that all counties across the country are having the same concerns, but not with the same landscape as Nevada. It is my hope that with these workshops, we can position ourselves in a positive way to bring revenue and responsible growth into our counties without putting out a necessary burden, unnecessary burden to our communities. With that being said, I want to kick us off with a brief overview of the impetus behind developing this workshop and the current state of renewable energy development in Nevada. As most of you are probably aware, this is a tremendous amount. There is a tremendous amount of interest in renewable energy development, both in Nevada and nationwide, as industry works to meet energy diversification goals. The state of Nevada has set renewable energy portfolio standard goals of 50% of energy from renewals by 2030. The current federation, federal administration has set a goal to completely decarbonize carbonize the electric get, grid by 2035. The Inflation Reduction Act earmarked about $5 billion for climate pollution reduction grants through the EPA, and utility companies nationwide have begun the process of decommissioning coal-fired power plants and transitioning to new sources of electric generation. These factors has created what has become something of a solar rush in Nevada, where we have lots of public land and sunshine. Nevada leads the nation in solar power potential and currently ranks sixth in the nation in total solar capacity and generation. About 40% of Nevada's total in-state electricity net generation currently comes from renewable energy resources. According to BLM's Active Renewable Projects website, as of January of this year in Nevada, there were five new utility solar projects approved for construction totaling 10,706 acres and 1,789 megawatts of output. There are another seven projects in the NEPA review totaling 88,967 acres and 8,850 megawatts of output. Then there are currently an additional three projects proposed that are awaiting NEPA review that would occupy 6,100 acres and 880 megawatts of production. Uh, our panelists from BLM may have more current data on this. Well, within the next six months, probably, but I don't know exactly. Are you all hearing this fine uh, on the Zoom, by the way? Yep, can hear good. Good deal. And, and if everyone just keep yourselves muted um, until we get to the question and answer period, that'd be great. With these projects and trends in mind and concern of our member counties regarding how solar development may affect local communities, land uses, and the provision of county services, 
we put together this workshop to hopefully identify win-win scenarios for continued renewable energy development across the state. With that, let me introduce today's panelists and highlight the areas they'll be covering. First, Brian Butazoni is a Nevada BLM project manager and NEPA specialist in the Renewable Energy Coordination Office. Brian is currently a project manager based in Reno. Over the past 13 years, he has been responsible for compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act. He has worked on land use planning in the Reno Carson City area for the past eight years and in the Phoenix area for five years prior to that. Currently, Brian is involved in the GreenLink West and GreenLink North projects here in Nevada. Brian will highlight the BLM's permitting and NEPA processes around the scale solar project development and discuss how BLM works to ensure projects have minimal negative impacts, government, environmental impacts, or land use conflicts. <laughs> next, next is Leslie Helmet from the Governor's Office of Energy. She currently serves as the Energy Program Manager at GOE. Ms. Helgett manages a diverse energy portfolio, which encompasses renewable energy tax abatements, solar, geothermal, regional transmission and distribution, grid resiliency, markets, and energy security. Her role involves overseeing and driving initiatives related to these critical aspects of the energy sector, contributing to the state's energy goals and sustainability efforts. Also with, with us today from the Governor's Office of Energy is John Shillow. Mr. Shillow is currently in Management Analysis 3 with the Nevada Governor's Office of Energy, a position he assumed in November of 2023, working in the RETA program. Prior to that, he worked for eight years with the Nevada Department of Taxation, centrally assessed properties as a utility valuation analyst, responsible for appraising rural electric cooperatives, interstate pipelines, photovoltaic solar projects, and recurrent property tax fiscal notes for the GOE RETA program. Before moving to Nevada, John worked for 31 years for the Office of Real Property Tax Services with the New York State Department of Tax and Finance as a complex real property appraiser. He holds a bachelor's degree in geology and a master of science degree in management. He is also a Nevada State Certified General Real Estate Appraiser. Leslie and John will present on the Governor's Office of Energy Renewable Energy Tax Abatement Program, as well as other tax considerations for counties around renewable energy development on public lands. Also joining us to present from the utility side of things is Jimmy Dag Daglian, Vice President of Renewables and Orientation at Nevada Energy. Jimmy's career started working for Alstom as a field service engineer before working at Pacific Corp, Corp as a corporate combustion engineer. After a brief stint with Clyde Bergman and Burner Project Development Projects, Jimmy worked in Morocco in an engineering support for TAQA Global before moving back to the U.S. and joining Nevada Energy in 2012. At Nevada Energy, Jimmy supported multiple roles, including director, generation support, and director, delivery operations, and his current role as Vice President of Renewables. Jimmy has a bachelor, bachelor's and master's degree in chemical engineering from the University of Utah and an MBA from Westminster College. Jimmy will present on Nevada Energy efforts toward meeting the state renewable energy goals. He also will discuss how counties and communities can work together with renewable energy developers to ensure positive outcomes. Lastly, joining us today is Brett Wagner, Director of Planning for Knight County. Prior to taking the lead at Knight County's Planning Department, Brett was an employee and a business owner in the construction industry, including over 30 years in home building, commercial tenant improvements, and land development. Knight County has been at the center of much of the solar rush in Nevada, and Brett has made it a planning department goal to be efficient, public friendly, and equitable. Brett has also recently developed an ordinance for Knight County to deal with solar and wind energy proposals which will look promising to serve as a possible model for other counties. Brett will discuss his work on this ordinance as my county has seen a rapid increase in utility scale solar project proposals. I want to thank all uh, members. Thank you to, to all the members of our panel for being willing to join us today. 
Before we start begin our program, I want to provide some minor housekeeping items. Please make sure that your phones or computers are muted while you're not speaking to avoid background noise. We will take questions at the end of the presentations and we'll have plenty of time for this. So please hold the majority of questions to the end. You can also type questions into the Zoom chat feature. If something comes up to mind that you're worried about, you know, if you're gonna forget it, we'll compile those uh, questions and run through them at the end. We also uh, designed this format to be a roundtable discussion. So we do encourage participants to provide input and lots of questions. Finally, this workshop is being recorded and we'll post a link to the NACO YouTube page. So if there's someone from your county who was interested in coming today and weren't able to attend, please let them know these resources will be made available to them. So we'll start it off with uh, Brian Budazoni from Nevada BLM. One second to get your slides up, Brian. There's, there's animations where I'll have a sentence and then yeah, I'll, not all the text will show up at once. I do that intentionally. Yeah, I got those so yeah, there we go. And I'll actually give you the click. You just hit that oh, button and then you should yeah, advance. Right there. Well, thank you for um, inviting me to um, represent, present for the Bureau of Land Management. And I work out of the Reno office. Renewable Energy Coordination Office. Um, what I would um, give you the context of is essentially that that office is in still in formation. Um, it was initiated about two years ago under this administration's renewable um, prioritization. And we are continuing to build our team as has been described. There's a con um, considerable um, proliferation of renewable energy requests across the state. We um, use the authority of the Federal Land Management and Policy Act to develop resource management plans. At the county level or the city level, you might call them zones or zoning, like commercial zones, residential zones, agricultural zones. We call them allocations. And the trivia um, for today is, what is the most numerous in acres land use allocation on the Bureau of Land Management lands in Nevada and the United States. In fact, it's not something that people think about as a land use allocation, but in fact it is. It's livestock grazing, and livestock grazing is allowable on approximately 150 million acres out of the 250, 45 million acres that the Bureau of Land Management administers. And then there are all kinds of other types of allocations that the Bureau of Land Management has. And in a later slide, we'll talk a little bit about what's going on with the solar planning um, in the state and across the country. Most of the resource management plans within the state of Nevada are significantly out of date. And most of our prioritization of planning efforts is driven by national planning efforts such as currently revising the greater sage-grouse plans. And if you're not already aware, the new greater sage-grouse plans hit the market today for 90 days public comment. And then the other national planning effort that's underway is the Western Solar Plan amendments. The original Western Solar Plan was in 2012, and that is the next slide as to what's going on with the updates to the Western Solar Plan. So this is again, the second national planning effort we have going on. The 90 day comment period on the Western Solar Plan revisions ends on April 18th. So just over a month away. And I believe there are still a couple of workshops, although not in the state of Nevada that are still gonna be completed between now and April 18th. A um, couple features of what we're considering in the updates to the Western Solar Plan. 
is the elimination of the solar energy zones. There were only about 200,000 acres of solar energy zones spread across several states. And there are contributing reasons as to why they didn't add much value to uh, looking at opportunities for solar development on the public lands. Another element that's being looked at as being either significantly changed or eliminated altogether is what we call the variance process. The variance process was intended to be a pre-screening effort to try to better site projects on the landscape and look at resource and other socioeconomic and biological and cultural conflicts. Didn't really turn out to be that way. And this is one of the factors as to why we're looking at either changing it or possibly eliminating it entirely. The 2012 plan applied to six Western states. The 2024 plan would apply to 11 Western states. I have seen some media reports that this plan would greatly expand uh, the opportunity for solar development on Bureau of Land Management lands. I'm not sure I would characterize it that way because we're adding five more states into the hopper. And in adding those five more states into the hopper, of course, we're adding more lands in those states that could be open to solar development. I actually saw the information on Nevada itself and overall Bureau of Land Management lands within the state of Nevada that would be available to, to solar development will decrease under alternative five, not increase. The reasonably foreseeable development scenario is what we put together with our land use planning projects. And for the state of Nevada, the document characterizes the reasonably foreseeable development scenario for Nevada as 48,000 acres of solar development through 20, 2045. Alternative three was identified as the Bureau of Land Management preferred alternative. I may, I may have just said alternative five, alternative three. And as you can see here, alternative three is the Bureau of Land Management is preferred alternative. And throughout the state of Nevada, 6.9 million acres would be available for solar application. 40.1 million acres would be excluded from solar application. So that's a little bit on the Western Solar Plan revision that's ongoing, and you may be a cooperating agency already for this, and maybe um, queuing up your comments that hopefully you'll receive by April 18th, um, which is the deadline. And there is the project website. If you've not been to the project website yet, that link is on the bottom of slide number two. So let's talk a little bit about um, how we arrange planning within the state of Nevada. It is by district, and each of the districts on this map are represented in different colors. Um, we have six Bureau of Land Management districts that cover the Bureau of Land Management lands across the state of Nevada, except for a tiny bit of northwestern Nevada. And these plans are supposed to set the framework, the allocations, the objectives for managing these lands over the next 20 years. Well, as you can see by looking at these different districts, and the dates of the resource management plans associated with these districts. We have some districts that are operating under plans that are about 40 years old. Whether you're coming in from the perspective of conservation or whether you're coming in from the perspective of development, chances are these plans are probably not meeting your interests. Given how technology changes, how our use of the public lands change. And the biggest district that's the most out of whack is the Battle Mountain District, which is in the central part of the state, occupying about 10 million acres of public lands. And its land use plans are from 1986 and 1997. So clearly these plans do not meet current or future interests, whether it's conservation or development. 
Some of you may have heard within the last four years about the Bureau of Land Management initiating a complete redo of all of these plans across the entire state. It's being called the Nevada Statewide Resource Management Plan Modernization Project. And there was outreach that was started maybe about four years ago on this, but due to lack of funding, prioritization of, of the other planning efforts, uh, politicize, politicization of our planning efforts, there has been no formalization of that statewide modernization um, planning effort. Maybe in 2025, there would be actual formal outreach to the public, cooperating agencies and others on this planning effort. So right now, these are the plans we're working under throughout the six districts in the state. And as you can see, the Winnemucca district has the most current plan and even it is nine years old. It's not advancing. Let's see the cursor's moving, but it's not, there we go. So I know today's focus is on solar projects and um, we do have 133 pending applications for renewable energy projects across the entire state. Renewable energy projects consist of solar, wind, geothermal, and even our transmission lines. There are about 85 pending applications for solar projects across the state on Bureau of Land Management lands. And you can see this table breaks down those projects by county between which ones are pending and which ones are authorized and the megawatts associated with them or the gigawatts, I should say, associated with them. As was indicated earlier, the two projects that I have a great deal of time that I'm spending on right now are the GreenLink West and the GreenLink North projects. The GreenLink West project comes from Las Vegas up to Reno on the western side of Nevada and the GreenLink North project crosses the northern part of the state, the blue line on this map. There has been a perception that's been out there um, in the media and otherwise that the names kind of give these projects away as being the conduit to extensive renewable energy development in the state. I'm not exactly sure that's how these um, projects are gonna completely line themselves out once they're built. They will to some degree facilitate renewable energy development in the state, but that's not actually the justification from NV Energy as to why um, they made these requests from us or to us about three years ago. Along um, the GreenLink West project, I'm just gonna give you an example of one of the clusters that there is that we're evaluating of solar projects. So as I said, there are about 75, uh, sorry, about 85 pending applications for solar projects in the state. And I'm now zooming into Esmeralda County, west of Tonopah, uh, northwest of Goldfield. And you can see in this map and the names associated with them, there is a cluster of seven solar development projects that are in National Environmental Policy Act review currently. Scoping has already been completed for these solar development projects. Now, the one reason why I'm highlighting these is because the clicker is, it may be, um, can you advance to the next text? <laughs> While we're working on the technology here, the reason why I'm highlighting <laughs> these solar developments is because this is one approach to when we have a situation where we have multiple projects and applications within a given area, we do a programmatic environmental analysis rather than site-specific environmental analysis. So the traditional practice would be an application comes in, 
And then we run that application through the National Environmental Policy Act analysis. And then eventually that will result in the authorization of that project. This approach is that all seven solar developments are being considered under one programmatic National Environmental Policy Act review. And by doing it this way, we actually have a better handle on the big picture issues associated with this development complex. Um, while these seven applications cover 62,000 acres, that does not re represent the actual development area for these applications. Most likely, these seven solar projects will occupy less than half and maybe even less than thir a third of the 62,000 acres. So one of the things we have to be careful about is that we may receive an application for a 10,000 acre solar project, but the actual development footprint might only occupy 1,000 acres. Going further south into Nye County, just to give another example, of a group of solar developments. And that office, Las Vegas or Southern Nevada office has taken a different approach as to how to do the National Environmental Policy Act compliance. There are five pending solar applications in one area. One has already been authorized, Yellow Pine. The other one, Rough Hat, is currently in um, draft environmental impact statement review with the comment period ending on April 11th. So in just a couple of weeks, the comment period on Rough Hat ends. And I'm just illustrating here again, we have a cluster of solar development projects. That district office has elected to take a different approach than what's going on in Esmeralda County. Here, each one of these projects is triggering their own environmental impact statement rather than one environmental impact statement programmatically assessing the impacts, concerns, and otherwise associated with those seven projects. Begin becoming a cooperating agency is the best thing for you to do, and it should not be None of these projects I've identified today should be coming of surprise to any of you in the counties associated with these projects. Hopefully you're already cooperating agencies. This is the best mechanism for you to be directly involved in these projects when they enter into the National Environmental Policy Act um, stage of the process because you get enhanced opportunities to participate in the review process. So my two colored bubbles, public scoping in orange and public review in black is what the general public gets in terms of opportunities for commenting and participating in reviewing and providing feedback on the documents. Cooperating agencies likely get two additional rounds of opportunities to provide input on these documents. And those are the two uh, milestones that have the stars associated with them. So those are unique review opportunity milestones associated with cooperating agencies. How do you learn about where there are these 133 pending applications for renewable energy projects throughout the state. First, stay in contact with your local Bureau of Land Management district office. Hopefully, the field manager and the district manager is periodically making presentations to your county commissioners, or your county board of supervisors. I did this when I worked in Carson City for eight years. Our field manager made periodic about once or twice a year presentations to the various county boards to keep them uh, informed of what our priorities were and the other activities were. You can also go into the e-planning website and do a search there. That's the link for the e-planning website. And maybe somebody in your planning program knows all about LR2000. 
and LR2000 is the database we have. And there is a public facing version of the database. So you can see what has been serialized, what has been uh, in NEPA as pending or an authorized project. And with that, the, the gizmo is not working again, but I'm on the last slide, I'm pretty sure. And that was questions. And I think maybe maybe it's a battery power issue with your gizmo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that happens. Well, it doesn't seem like an advanced either. I'm pretty sure that was the last slide. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you, you can keep me on track on the time here. Uh, but do we have a couple minutes here for brief questions? Um, let's see. Yeah. We'll open up with some brief questions. I think uh, Jeremy had a question here in the room. Yeah, I had one, Brian, on that cluster in Esmeralda County. Is there either an existing substation or a planned substation that would plumb those projects into Green Lake West? The Esmeralda substation is a component of the Green Lake West project. Now, the Green Lake West project does not have the capacity to handle all of those electrons from those seven solar projects. I think it's only two out of seven could possibly be tied into Green Link West. Well, we have an application, three of them pending from Transcon for a project called Western Bounty. And Western Bounty is gonna originate with that seven solar complex. And one line would go up to Idaho, another line would go to Oregon, and another line would go to Southern California. You'll be hearing about that, those three projects early next year. So we're in very early discussions with those applicants, but that's probably how those electrons would get pushed off those other solar projects that GreenLink West does not have capacity for, is having additional transmission lines connect to that Esmeralda substation and then grab the electrons from those other solar projects that the GreenLink West project does not have the capacity for. Thanks. So this GreenLink West is going to be a totally separate power line. It's not going to go into the main grid. The GreenLink West starts at the Miraloma sub, ends in the Miraloma substation and begins at the Harry Allen substation. So North Las Vegas to just south of Reno. Because currently everything goes right into the grid and it's just kind of. Well, I mean, down. right. This is where people always ask us, where are those electrons going? We can't tell you where the electrons right. going. And I'm not even sure if NV Energy can completely tell you where the electrons are going because they go into an endpoint, a substation. And from there, they're pushed into the grid. And whether they, those electrons stay in Nevada or yeah. whether they go to California, that's beyond our role in this. I, I think Jimmy will be able to help us yeah. a little, a little time to get on the Because we've had people comment and say, frankly, you shouldn't be developing resources in Nevada and exporting them out of state. But in fact, look at all the resources that we have in Nevada, gold and silver. Now lithium has gotten to be a big issue in Battle Mountain District where there are multiple applications for lithium mines in addition to our livestock grazing, in addition to all the solar developments, most of that's being ex exported out of state. So it isn't unique to renewables that these resources are going out of state because we have 63% of the federal lands in, the, in Nevada are Bureau of Land Management. So it's not a surprise that happens. Anyone? Uh, I have one question um, that maybe you'll be able to answer or not, that 48,000 acres of re reasonable foreseeable development. Um, I understand that came from National Renewable Energy Lab study. Uh, we just had a lot of questions like about that because it seems like we already have proposals that exceed that. And, and that same study had more acreage in um, Idaho and Washington and Oregon, places where they don't have the solar radiance that we do. So any thoughts about that number? And they did break it down by state. So there were numbers for each of the states as to what the reasonably foreseeable. To, and I only saw it yesterday because I just don't have the time to focus on the solar revisions. But I would need to look and see if 
where they have a table or where the source of the information is they got from the, their actual pending applications, right? So I think we have 55 gigawatts of pending applications for solar in the state and where that all laid out. Um, and I do have a spreadsheet that shows all of these and I can certainly forward it to you and then you can include it in the notes today as to where all these pending applications are by name and by case file number rather than just telling you there's 22 in Clark County and six in Carson City. We actually have it broken down by who the applicant is, how many gigawatts that application is associated with, what office has got that case file sort of thing. But I'd have to dive a bit deeper with the lab to figure out how they came up with 48,000 acres. But part of the problem I alluded to is the Esmeralda 7 complex looks like 62,000 acres. And it isn't. So we're managing one solar project near Indian Springs called Bonanza. It's in Clark County. The application area was 5,100 acres, but their developable area or their buildable area is only 2,400 acres. So if we just assumed that Esmeralda is not going to occupy more than 50%, Already that's down to 30,000 acres. So I don't know what, how they came up with that number. And the challenge we get is people see something as pending and then they see an acres associated with it, which is the application area, not the developable area. They're different. And we won't know that second number until we run it through the National Environmental Policy Act permitting process as to what the actual developable acres are. Yeah. Fair enough. I, I think it just seems on that number, the BLM could correct the National Renewable Energy Lab because that's a 2045 uh, foreseeable development. And, and if, you know, we are already here approaching that number. Um, and, and, you know, we're in a bubble. There's no better way to characterize it. We have several initiatives pushing for renewable energy, the 2020, 25 by 25 the Nevada state portfolio, high demand from California, right? Because they have much more aggressive per, per, um, per, um, portfolio. We're in a bubble. So what does that mean? We're getting applications and quite frankly, some of them are quite speculative. Or even we're looking at them going, is that really a feasible location? Um, down next to our Bonanza project, there's been an application pending for 14 years and never been acted upon. So that's the other caveat if you get into LR2000 and you see all this list of all these pending applications, that does not mean it's impending because we have one experience of, it's called South Solar Ridge, again, about seven miles west of Indian Springs. And that application has been stalled, static or otherwise for 14 years, why? You'd have to ask the applicants as to why they didn't push the BLM to push their project ahead. Now they are 15 years later because they're seeing a confluence of circumstances all coming together. The IRA, all of these renewable energy pushes, plus an administration that's favorable to this activity. And now they're pushing Southern Nevada to move ahead on the project. Why are you considering um, eliminating the variance process? That seems like a pretty important process to skip. Well, okay, so the variance process under the solar plan is actually referenced in one of the appendixes. And it was supposed to provide a screening to help better cite with the applicant where it's best um, or least impacts. No impacts doesn't happen anywhere, right? but least impacts or, or most beneficial or otherwise supposed to help us internally screening these things. But the challenge with that is we had um, some offices take that and start requiring the applicant to complete all their baseline studies. So they were starting to pay money to go out and get all the cultural surveys done and pay money to get all the biological surveys done. And this is the variance process. And then we also had offices invent comment periods that look like we were in the National Environmental Policy Act process. So 
it didn't ultimately end up resulting in more inf information for us and the stakeholders and the others that were involved in the variance process. And therefore, they're looking back at that and saying either we change it, scale it down, or possibly eliminate it entirely because it didn't actually result in better siting would be the, what I would say the bottom line is. The best siting is going to be with all that baseline study information because you don't know where uh, National Historic Trail fragments are or cultural sites are or endangered species habitat is until you get all those baseline studies. So I think the other side of it is applicants were being pushed to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on studies. And there was not actually no guarantee the project was then going to enter into the National Environmental Policy Act process. I'm not sure if I'd be comfortable with that if I was an applicant to put out hundreds of thousands of dollars for baseline studies and not, not have confirmation from the agency that the project would ever go forward. Yeah, um, question from Andy real quick, and then we better move on. So we have, um, go ahead, Andy. Thanks, Jacob. Um, I had two questions. Jacob brought up the first one having to do with that 48,000 RFD for Nevada. I would just point out that's on page 2-34 of the PEIS, and it is a 20-year projection. So there are some real concerns with that number, given that the projection for, say, solar development on public lands in Washington is uh, almost two-thirds more than what we're seeing the RFD be for Nevada. That's something that really needs a very careful look. Um, the question I'd like to ask, in addition to that, making that point, is what criteria are the BLM using to determine whether these projects require uh, an EIS or an EA. Um, on the BLM's Renewable Energy Active Development page, what I'm seeing is that there are a lot of solar developments that are being uh, going through the NEPA process on the EA level as opposed to the EIS level. And we have a couple concerns with regard to that. One, as you know, uh, cooperating agency engagement for EAs is optional as opposed to EISs where it is required. So the ability of local governments to be cooperating agencies on those EAs is strictly discretionary, which is something um, given the potential impacts of these developments, um, we're not entirely comfortable with. And there's also a 75 page limit cap on these EAs, which I think can be extended to about 150 pages at the discretion of the project manager. But I'm interested, you know, given that we're looking at projects where the disturbance is thousands of acres of, you know, complete eradication of vegetation, habitat, so on and so forth. Um, can you shine a little bit of light on what would cause the BLM to do an EA as opposed to e an EIS? And second, in the case that the BLM does choose an EA, is there some kind of policy by which they are, um, or you are allowing cooperating agencies to be uh, involved in those EAs, given the potential impacts to local governments and citizenry that can be caused by those projects? So I heard kind of three topics and how are we doing on time and or do you want me to pick this up at the end? I could come back to them, but there's kind of three themes, couple, three items here. Um, up to you. I mean, we, yeah, we're 45 minutes in, so we probably better, if, if you can't answer them quickly, maybe we save so them to the end. First, regarding when do we do an environmental assessment versus when do we do an environmental impact statement? I wished we had black and white thresholds of if it's this, then you must do an EA. If it's that, you must do an environmental impact statement. There's only a couple conditions, a couple situations where that it that the, that is the case. Mines, for whatever reason, the policy is if a mine is greater than 640 acres, we must do that mine under an environmental impact statement. 
there's never been the proliferation of that kind of criteria or threshold to any other projects. And to give you an example, Libra Solar is out there on the market or recently out on the market, <clears throat> Lion County, I believe. There's no cultural impacts. There's no endangered species. I'm not even sure it's in um, greater sage grouse habitat, but the office elected to push it into an environmental impact statement. So we look at a myriad of factors because there's no defined threshold between what goes into an EA versus what goes into an EIS. Cooperating agencies, that's a lot of discretion at the local BLM office and district office as to whether or not they invite cooperating agencies for EAs or not. Um, so you need to let them know of your interest um, when you hear about the project, which sometimes may be when they announce public scoping. But public scoping is completely optional for an environmental assessment. There is no mandatory requirement to go out for public scoping for an environmental assessment. So that makes a challenge for cooperating agencies and the public as to how do you know about getting early on into a project that doesn't have public scoping. And then lastly, we have a big challenge with the revised National Environmental Policy Act that happened last summer, which doesn't seem to have caught most, most people's attention. Environmental assessments must now be under 75 pages and environmental impact statements must now be under 300 pages. I'm working on one, Greenlink West, it is 4,000 pages. When you add 27 appendices plus a 700 page EIS, and we are all sorting out how to deal with all of these now legally imposed page limits. Just a couple thoughts. Very good, thank you. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next item. Uh, next position panelist, Leslie Helgett and John Schillow. Get your slides up here. Good morning. I'm John. Uh, Leslie Helgett is the Energy Program Manager Lead for the Governor's Office of Energy. She's quite adept at handling the RETA program. She won't tell you that, but I will. Uh, so why are we here? We were invited to explain this process and, and how the Governor's Office of Energy is involved. Okay. No, I, I did that. I thought it wasn't working for you, but I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, uh, in the NRS, it says that the director of the governor's office of energy will come up with a comprehensive plan for the state energy. Uh, overlook. And what we do is we uh, en enhance uh, the development in the state of energy projects and the use of renewable energy. Uh, so uh, one reason why we're here is that if there's any questions from a, a local government or a developer, they can come to us and ask, and we coordinate discussions so that the renewable energy projects can be uh, developed and there's just more information that's put out there. Uh, this shows you what we're looking at. Uh, to put the new bat out there, this is, what a what resource we're receiving the solar irradiance is compared to other states further to the north and east uh, these are identified geothermal locations and as you can see in nevada there's a lot more yellow dots and that's just identified this is unidentified. So there's quite the resource between the uh, solar irradiance and 
the geothermal resources. So what Rita does in Nevada, it's a partial sales tax, a partial use tax, and a partial property tax abatement on renewable energy projects. Uh, and it can be everything from biomass to wind to geothermal, uh, solar, of course. It's whatever is uh, even... Uh, <clears throat> anything that's renewable energy. Uh, so it's meant to attract developers to this state, to look at the state and see if they can develop a good source of renewable energy. Uh, the program requires that they employ at least 50% of their workers during construction and that they, they're going to be paid 175% of the average wage during the construction. We review the applications. Uh, it goes then to uh, public hearings for eligibility. And annually, once, once a project is approved, if it is, there's compliance reports that have to be met by every a renewable project that's under the RETA program. So it isn't something where we just let it go. We look after what's going on. So far, uh, there've been 60, over 16,000 construction jobs in this state. And right now there's 623 operational jobs or people working on these uh, renewable energy facilities. They're earning 40 to $45 an hour. Uh, so far, there's been over, over $10 billion invested, capital investment in Nevada. And of that, 1.2 billion are taxes that have been abated. So as you can see, uh, the investment far exceeds the abatements. Uh, this includes over $11 billion payroll in taxes in Nevada. Uh, of that, there's uh, 886 million in property and sales to tax benefits. Right now, there's uh, over 6,000 megawatts of energy from 64 projects that have been gone through the RETA process. So when they apply, the uh, facility has to be in operation at least 10 years. It has to be a 10 megawatt minimum. So we, there could be other renewable energy projects out there less than that. We, they just don't apply. Are we? And during the project, 50% of the people working on it have to be Nevada residents. And as I said, the construction workers are paid 175% of the uh, average hourly wage in the state. And they're provided health care insurance for themselves and their dependents by a third party. And this is all reviewed also annually in the compliance. So we also require that there's in counties over 100,000 people, which would be Washoe and Clark, that they're investing in Nevada at least $10 million in the project. Uh, and there has to be at least 75 people that are uh, full-time construction employees. Uh, in the counties where there's less than 100,000 or a city of less than 60,000, they have to invest at least $3 million. And they would have at least 50 construction employees full-time. 
So a project will submit uh, three different uh, applicate, copies of the application. We review it to see if everything meets it and we assign it a number, an application number, which we follow. Uh, and then we send the not notices out immediately to the state offices and the counties. So the first part of this is fiscal notes, which uh, GOE does not do. Where it's sent, first of all, to the Department of Taxation. Uh, they will do the sales and use tax fiscal notes, the property tax fiscal notes, and uh, then there's fiscal notes by the Department of Administration. And the fiscal notes don't set, for instance, an assessment on the property. They're just estimates of the impact to the state and the county. We send a redacted application to the counties and a copy goes to the county treasurer, to the board of commissioners, and to the assessor. So they have 30 days then, <clears throat> the commissioners to object to this project uh, and they have to respond back to us in writing. And they must also uh, demonstrate the projected cost of the services to the county uh, that would, if they're rejecting it, that the cost of the services would surpass the revenue and the benefits. So after those 30 days, we will schedule the hearing. Uh, and within 15 days, uh, we send out notices that people would be their intent to participate in the hearing. The hearing is held uh, and the application is approved or denied. Then we send out the <clears throat> order, the abatement agreement, and the certificate of eligibility, which notifies yeah. <clears throat> the Department of Taxation about the sales tax abatement. So they're aware of it. Uh, as I said, the fiscal notes are just an estimate of the fiscal impact from these uh, projects. And one is from the uh, Department of Taxation centrally assessed properties, another from uh, sales and tax unit from taxation, and then the chief of the budget division prepares a third one. So <clears throat> the biggest projects that GOE receives applications for <clears throat> are the geothermal power plants and the solar projects. Geothermal plants, uh, according to the NRS, will be valued by the Department of Taxation because officially it's a mining operation. Uh, if the whole solar project is within a county. It's a locally assessed. The exception to this is in the IRS. <clears throat> As you can see, if there's <clears throat> a necessary part of that project that crosses county lines, for instance, if a, a substation is in this adjoining county, then it would be not locally assessed, it would be centrally assessed. So going into what it says a little bit in the address about real property. <clears throat> Anything that's erected, any structure or foundations or any improvement is classed as real property. Uh, 
uh, because these are attached to the land and the land is an integral part of this <clears throat> project. Uh, for instance, a truck on the project is not part of real property. Since it's personal property, it's not attached to the land. So, big question that comes up is the taxable possessory interest. Uh, this is when an entity has the right to a beneficial use of a tax-exempt government-owned property. <clears throat> In other words, many of these projects, if not most of them, would be on government-owned land. It's leased. They're leased. They have to enter in, lease it from this fellow right here. <laughs> Uh, and we need to tell you, we don't, uh, GOE doesn't set assessments. We don't tell anybody how to assess things. We're, we're saying, please ask questions <clears throat> of the lo a local assessor or the Department of Taxation. We're just saying this is what is in the NRS. Um, so that's, that's if it. you have questions, please <clears throat> ask our department. Uh, we'll be happy to answer anything about the RETA process. Um, so, okay. yeah. So do we have any questions in the room? I actually had two. So you had mentioned a partial abatement for sales, use, and property tax. Are those partial amounts set somewhere? Um, is it determined by project? Can you give us kind of a general range? Yes. <laughs> All the above. <laughs> you want me to field that one? Yep. So the uh, sales and use tax abatement um, is all but 2.6%. So the project will be paying the 2.6% tax in each county across the board. And then the personal property tax and the real property tax abatement is 55% across the board. And then the second question is, when does the RETA process and application occur in relation to NEPA? And the reason I ask this is a lot of times a project will come in to a county and say, as part of their socioeconomic impact that Brian's got to put into the NEPA documents, you know, here's the revenue that we're going to generate, but they don't always incorporate in the RETA abatements, right? So then inevitably we get county commissioners that ask them, well, that's great on your socioeconomic impact, but what percent is coming out due to RETA? And they kind of talk by each other. So has there been any discussion as to when your process occurs in relation to when their NEPA document's going on? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The only time that, um, by the time a project comes to the governor's office of energy and requests a tax abatement, they have gone through every process. They have gone through the, uh, the PUC, PUCN's regulatory approvals. They've gone through the BLM and all of their approvals. So it'd be post NEPA. Yeah, and they're they're fully approved and ready to go. Uh, if I could go back, the sales and use tax is for three years. Yes. And the property tax abatement is 20. And we, it's projected out in the fiscal notes so that uh, they can see what, when, when it's approved, those fiscal notes are <clears throat> put on the website so anybody can see <clears throat> any project under RETA of what the estimates are. And that's what I'm emphasizing there. It will be handled, you know, the assessment process will be handled by the county assessors. So at a 20 year property tax abatement on a project that has a lifespan of 20 years for the those panels. So it's abated for the total life of the project. 
assume you, if the panels won't work at the end of 20 years, right? Yeah. Yes. So I do have a question on that. When we were talking about the difference between geothermal and solar, where geothermal is um, based on mining, and typically mining generates net proceeds. Yes. Are those net proceeds subject to that uh, abatement? Um, no, yeah. they wouldn't. They, oh, oh, let's see. Actually, I'll let you answer that. I, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> we might, we'll have to get back to you on that one. Okay. That, I, that could be answered by centrally assessed properties. Thank you. Yeah, just because there's a difference between solar and geothermal and how that was paid. Yes. So, yes. I mean, net proceeds is a big. It's I huge. Mean, mining me. is huge. In this state, it is. Geothermal is huge. huge. It's got a portion of it. It's not bad. So, when the county is looking at that, that could be something. It's, it's an additional fund that they would get, I'm sure. So, Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, that would be a that would be a question for the Department of Taxation. But net proceeds is for mines, which you consider well, geothermal. The geothermal. Yes. Yeah, that would be a question yep. for the Department of Taxation. Is net proceeds even considered a tax, or is it all in a separate bucket? Uh, I don't know. Well, it's handled in centrally assessed properties, but uh, it's similar to a county treasurer, <clears throat> how they handle uh, the billing for a solar project within the county. Uh, the money is collected by taxation process and it's sent back to the county. There's someone online has a question. No, I think I think we're good and I think we better move, move along. On. If you do have questions, like I say, uh, type them in the chat or if you're in the room, make a note and we'll try to get to more at the end, but we're um, starting to use up time. Yeah, let's go to the utility side and uh, bring in Jimmy Gaglian. Jimmy, I think you can just uh, share your screen if that, that should work. Okay. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Apologies for not being up in Carson City. I'm just down here in Las Vegas. And let me see. We don't use Zoom a lot. So let me see how I can share. Maybe Jacob, you can kind of walk me through that. Uh, down there on your bottom bar. Uh, just says share screen. Ah. Okay. Hopefully you can see my screen now pops up. Yeah, I think we're in business. I might just switch it to uh, <clears throat> presenter view and, and we're good to go. Okay. Live or slideshow or however you want to do it. Popped up in the other screen. So let me. Uh... Okay. Hopefully that works. Is everyone online seeing that? I can see it. Thanks, Ken. Uh -oh. All right. So it's on my third screen. So I'll be looking at it as I walk through. Um, <clears throat> so good morning, everyone. Thank you, commissioners. Um, Happy to be here joining at least virtually the uh, the panel. Um, so just uh, some of this information is a recap from the last uh, meeting that we had. So I, I'd like to go through that a little bit quicker. Um, I did want to provide an overview of where we are in the state as it pertains to just renewables in general, but in, in particular solar. Um, <clears throat> We'll kind of hone in on Nevada specifically, what we're seeing, what are some of the opportunities, challenges, and then the future outlook. So just, I can keep it at the high level, but if there's any questions or anything specific we need to delve into, I'd be happy to uh, you know do my best effort to answer them. <clears throat> so um, 
And the energy, uh, I think most people are familiar with, with the company. Um, you know, we, we cover about 90% of the population within the state. Um, so significant, um, you know, 1.5 million between uh, our share uh, Pacific Power Company, SPPC, which is in the north. It's technically two companies. We have Sierra Pacific Power Company in the north and uh, Nevada uh, Power in the south. A DBA as NV Energy, that's what people know us as. It's about 2,500 employees uh, scattered across the state um, and more than half of our empl employees are bargaining unit. Um, 1245 in the north and 396 in the south. Um, so I think you've probably seen this in the past. We have a lot of projects, renewable projects uh, in Nevada. Uh, a lot of them are what we call power purchase agreements. Uh, this is where developers uh, come in and, and do bids through typically what we call an open resource RFP, bid in projects. We do an evaluation, uh, due diligence, and then uh, we make a selection on which product projects uh, provide the, the best value for our customers. And uh, we submit those projects for evaluation and commission approval. Uh, as, as you may know, we, we have oversight by the Public Utilities Commission of Nevada. So we have to go through that approval process before we finalize uh, the projects and um, they become part of our resources. And when we're doing resource planning, I think the question came up earlier. Uh, we do look at what our load forecast is within the state. So that's that's a big factor. And I'll talk to that a little bit more. Uh, but when we're planning our resources, we're planning them for the state of Nevada. We're not you know, looking at outside states or the market or anything like that. Uh, you know, we have an obligation to serve our customers as safe, reliable service. And that's that's the focus when we're evaluating what resources we need, what type of resources and how much. Okay, so um, we have a, um, so let me skip through that and um, kind of give an overview of what are the main drivers for renewables uh, within the state. So there are uh, certain policies and mandates that we have to follow. Uh, for example, we have the renewable portfolio standards uh, that uh, gets to, it kind of ratchets up, it rises up. Um, to, it's at 34%, goes to 42% in 2027, and then um, and then to 50% in 2030. And, and what that simply means is that for every megawatt that's generated in the state, let's just assume it's 50%, 50% of that energy needs to come from renewable resources. So we kind of tally up all the production that's in the state, and we have to demonstrate that 50% of that came from renewable resources. So those are things that we have to comply with. Uh, these are state laws. Uh, things that policies that kind of shape uh, renewable acceleration are things like the Inflation Reduction Act. So uh, through tax benefits, of course, RITA is another one that we were just covering here. Those are tax benefits that um, provide basically fuel to acceleration of renewables. Uh, so those are the two from a federal, state, and local policy and, and regulation requirements that uh, is, is driving renewables within the state. Uh, this, the second factor is load growth. Um, you may hear, have heard that we have significant load growth, at least interest in load growth uh, within the state, mainly from data centers. Uh, so there's a, and mainly in Northern Nevada, that's kind of where we are. So if a customer comes in and says, I need to build a, a facility, you know, we're obligated to serve that, serve that loads. And uh, we have to factor it into our load forecast. The third is customer demands. Uh, you know, customers are demanding renewable resources. So, you know, we have an obligation to meet our customers' um, demands and desires. So there's kind of a general shift to renewables. And then the fourth driver for uh, renewable build out in the state is what we call the open capacity. <clears throat> Uh, what this is essentially is that uh, within the state, um, Nevada Power, at least, and energy uh, only can produce a certain amount. Um, it's about, you know, five, 6,000 megawatts. Um, so what that means is in the, the summer period, uh, say July 6, 7 p.m. at night, uh, our, our load, so, so it's five, 6,000 that 
those are company owned resources and probably another 2000 to 3000 that are uh, under power purchase agreements. Our load can be um, about 10,000 megawatts. So we do have a, a, a position typically in the summer at the peak hour uh, that we have an open capacity that we have to fill from the market. And the reason is, is it's kind of a two edged thing is we don't want to build too much resources for that, you know, like one, 2% of the time. Um, so we're kind of regulated on that from, from the, you know, how much we can build and close our open position. So we have to rely on a market to some extent. So we're not building too much infrastructure, if that makes sense. But at the same time, that means also means that we have to go to the market and get that energy when we really need it. And the issue that we've seen in the past four or five years is that that energy may not be available. So even if you know the, we're going to pay high amounts for that energy, a lot of the states or utilities are holding on to that capacity. So that's a risk. And, and you may have heard uh, resulting in like rolling blackouts and things like that in California here in the past year or two. I mean, that is the concern. So that's why we're trying to close that open capacity as much as we can. So uh, in a sense, we're less reliant on the market when we need that, when we really need that resource. So those are the driving factors for uh, the growth in the state, renewable growth in the state. Um, so current state, uh, there's about, um, and specifically on the solar side, there's about 2,200 megawatts of um, renewable solar that's, uh, that's operational. Um, of that, uh, well, uh, it's 3,000 in total. There's about 800 that's in construction. We expect those to achieve what we call commercial operation date or COD this month. So we're going to be able to add uh, another approximately 800 megawatts. So that's about 3,000 megawatts of solar that's, that's uh, you know, serving the grid and serving our customers. And then we have, uh, we have an integrated resource plan filing uh, this is where we say for the next 10, 20 years to meet, say, 100% or net zero target. Um, we have an obligation to build additional solar based on the load and based on RPS. Um, so we would be filing an um, integrated resource plan, additional resources. It will be filed in, uh, by June 1st this year. And we're looking at potentially about a thousand megawatts of uh, renewables that are gonna be filed in this upcoming uh, filing. So just kind of wanted to lay out what the current state is. So uh, what's available to us, right? When we're looking at what are we gonna be uh, procuring for um, renewable resources, um, as our friends at the uh, GOE pointed out, um, most of it is utility scale or distributed scale solar and battery. Um, you know, the state of Nevada has high irradiance, so it's certainly an attractive spot to, to, for solar. Uh, there's some geothermal. Um, there's a traditional geothermal that, um, you know, we've, we've procured um, that we're always looking for procuring in the future. Um, those are restricted uh, on how much we can get because, um, you know, it depends on if there's, if there's a, you know, the fluid that's that sufficient capacity. So there's a full development that goes through. Um, so that is certainly consideration when we're looking at options for renewables. And then also wind, um, you know, there's wind. It's not the best in the state. Uh, when we're looking at wind, uh, we look at what's called the capacity factor. Uh, that's essentially, you know, the, that resource what percent of the time is that going to be producing that, that those megawatt megawatt hours? So Nevada in general has a low capacity factor, and the best spots in the state is on the eastern part of the state. Um, and we actually have one project that's called Spring Mountain that's under a power purchase agreement. But we're definitely looking at you know wind as as a potential solution for renewables. Next slide. I just noticed I wasn't advancing my slides. I apologize for that. Okay, so why solar in Nevada? Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of key factors. One is the high irradiance. As uh, our friends at GOE pointed out, Nevada has high irradiance. That certainly makes the capacity higher. So for a fixed capital that you're gonna be investing, 
essentially you can produce more uh, output for a solar field, say Nevada versus other parts of the country that may not have that high radiance. So it's, it's certainly an attractive spot. Um, and we do an analysis, what's called the levelized cost of energy. <clears throat> From an LCOE standpoint, um, that certainly makes it attractive because we can produce more megawatts for a given fixed asset in the state of Nevada. So dri that drives the levelized cost of energy down in the state. Uh, there's available land, and I put an asterisk on this. I think our friends on BLM highlighted, uh, even though there's a lot of federal land, uh, a lot of it is restricted. Um, there's either solar energy zones or you have to go through a variance process. So, you know, people have friends of mine that drive into the state and they say, wow, you have a lot of free, you know, open land. And the fact is it's much different than that. So there is available land. Um, it has to be a certain size, right? Because if the, if the land is too small, then the, the build out is going to be expensive uh, from a levelized cost of energy standpoint, because you have certain costs that are fixed costs. So the, typically the bigger the project, uh, the more attractive the uh, cost of that uh, resources <clears throat> from a megawatt hour, dollars per megawatt hour standpoint. So you wanna look for parcels that are big enough, that are continuous, uh, where you can put uh, you know, panels and if, if it's batteries and you know, things like that. So what are the challenges? Uh, of course, the, the challenges is transmission. Uh, I'd say, uh, I mean, I, you know, we can interchange those three. Um, we're challenged by what's available in terms of transmission. Yes, it's one thing to build a generating facility, but you have to have the transmission to, um, to get those electrons from point A to point B. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we have the, the proper uh, transmission and the capacity available on those lines to um, the flow of the energy. Uh, there's land requirements. Um, you know, if, if it's a if it's a federal land, as as in BLM, you know, we got to go through the NEPA process. Obviously, talk to that extensively here. Um, and then the other uh, factors are uh, saturation of the market with the same type of resources. So, <clears throat> uh, I guess the the you know one of the um, the the blessings or curse or whatever you want to call it is that Nevada is has abundance of solar, but what it does for our company is we don't want to be over uh, reliant on one technology, right? So <clears throat> there's a there's a calculation called the effective load carrying capacity ELCC. So as we what that means is as we add more solar to the grid, the value of that solar goes down. So we can't count it as, as a firm capacity because things like you may have cloudy days, right? How do you, so how do you account for those? So we factor all those things in as we're adding more solar and we really aim for diversifying as much as we can outside of solar. Um, so we're definitely looking for um, opportunities where we're not just relying on solar for our renewable resources. Um, so opportunities, I think, uh, improved community engagement. Uh, you know, one of the things as MB Energy, we, we really focus on, I mean, we're serving our customers. We want to be partners in our customers. Uh, we're not interested in, you know, uh, we, we're not even allowed to build a facility with the intent of selling it to neighboring states. Our intent is to serve our native load. So we want to make sure that we're good community partners and, you know, getting good, good high paying jobs uh, for those for those assets. I think the other opportunity lies in improved long-term planning. Uh, this is where, you know, our transmission and the resource planning, really getting together, looking ahead, uh, just in terms of the timeline. Um, our colleagues at BLM, you know, they mentioned this. I mean, the, the process of building a transmission line typically is seven to 10 years. Uh, the process of building a generation plant is um, best case three years, but typically four to five years. So we really need to be planning in tandem, hand in hand on what that does this um, future build out look like. And I think there's an opportunity there. And then finally, it would be good to have clear policies, rules and regulations. I know we're constantly tweaking those, but in times of uncertainty, it's, it's hard to determine what's the best pathway on what that future is going to look like. So having clear policies, guidelines, rules, regulation, I think it helps with uh, with the process of 
uh, developing renewables within the state. Okay, so what is the future outlook? Um, what the future outlook lo looks like right now as, as we sit here today is it does look like it's going to be mainly solar and battery. Um, that will play continue to play a significant role in our transition to clean energy uh, within the state. Um, I touched on this earlier. We really need to look at resource diversification we can. Uh, we, we, we really want that. Um, so how do you get there? Um, you know, one way is look at, you know, if you have more efficient transmission, for example, and you have effective markets, ideally that is where you want to land, which is, you know, there might be, you know, for example, less expensive hydro in the Northwest that we can import or better wind from Wyoming or what have you. Ideally you're dispatching those resources in a, in a perfect market and you have enough transmission that you're able to import uh, the energy that just makes more sense and drives those, those costs down for our customers. Uh, so that's really where we need to get to. Even from a solar perspective, it might be say cloudy in, in Nevada or a certain portion of it, but Arizona may have uh, better irradiance on that day. So just maximizing that market and, and improving our transmission, interstate transmission, I think that will help. Uh, and there's a lot of effort going into that. Um, so. Um, I don't want to get into the details, but there's a whole lot of discussion on that. Um, the, the next thing is we really need to look at the diversification of renewable resources. Um, like I alluded to earlier, the, the big players are solar. There's some geothermal and very little wind in the state. Uh, if there's other technologies out there that would help us, you know, give us more options in terms of renewables. Uh, I think that is definitely something that we would be interested in. Um, so in the short term, uh, we want to hedge existing resources for safe and reliable systems. So short term, we have an obligation for RPS. We have an obligation to uh, close our open uh, capacity, make sure that we have reliable service for our customers. So we want to do everything we can in the next five years to, to get to that, uh, that objective. Long term, uh, really look at uh, development and investments within the state uh, to keep with uh, technological advancements. Um, it does seem like just, just generally speaking that, you know, we have these requirements, mandates. It does seem like the, the technology options is not vast. So hopefully the technology will catch up that we have different options when it comes to renewables. And then we will be procuring those options in the future. Um, that's, just solar will be part of it, but not the whole solution. Okay, then the, the next slide, I think Chris Dancy covered this. Um, you know, this kind of talks through what are the development phases for- uh, Hey, Jimmy, solar. sorry, we're still, we're still seeing the Nevada solar slide. I just wanted to let you know. Oh, ah, interesting. I don't know why there's a delay. Let me let me stop sharing and then try sharing again if that hopefully that fixes it. Thank you. There we go. Can you can you see it? Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can Jimmy. Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, sorry. I'm not sure what screen I'm sharing. I got three up and I'm, I'm like, I'm totally confused now. Uh, but I'd be happy to jump back if there's any questions and, and try to answer any questions that comes up. So, and, and essentially, I think Chris, Chris Dancy covered this um, in uh, the development uh, process flow. So initially, you know, five years plus, we're looking at site and project identification. Um, I think uh, Brian was highlighting, uh, you know, that's where we are, these are the early stages of development. Uh, then you wanna get into site development. This is where you take in site control, uh, or if it's a private land, uh, you may lease it or, or purchase it and so on and so forth. You have to go through the NEPA process. Um, I think a lot of that clusters that you see in Esmeralda or in um, uh, Amargosa, Nye County are, are probably in, in those phases. Then advanced development, this is where uh, you are, the, um, you've secured the land, uh, you're going through the NEPA process or you have uh, achieved the NEPA process, you're getting into final agreements. Uh, you have the financing development agreements. Um, if it's a, you know, you have your special use, 
Um, if it's a, um, you know, any, any permits are either achieved or, or received. Um, and then you have to get what's called the UEPO uh, with the Public Utilities Commission before you can construct that facility. And then the next phase after that, which is typically two years, that's where you do the construction. And then you have the commissioning testing. And uh, once you commission and test it, then you have an operating facility. So those are the steps. And with that, I get to the last slide. Any, any questions? We have any questions in the room? Go online. I have a general question, I guess. Nowhere today in any of the presentations have we heard about disposal of these panels and batteries. Where in the process does this get addressed? What What's the, the bonding requirements? What's the guarantee we're not going to have a bunch of trash laying around in the desert? Good question. Actually, we can address that at the end if you wanted to wait just a second. Okay. We got one more, and then uh, we'll hit that one first because I think that might be BLM and a couple, couple people. So okay, let's just keep on going. Go to Brett Wagner from Nye County, and then and, uh, then we'll open it up to questions for what time we have left. And Jimmy, I think you can stop sharing your screen now and. <laughs> We'll uh, hit you with some questions at the end if time permits. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Brett, you're you're up. Sir, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Apologize, I'm having some camera issues here, but I appreciate the invite and kind of share the knowledge that we've been working on here. Um, you know, Nye County, um, right now, as far as the latest information I've got from BLM, we have 19 pending applications uh, for solar, one pending application for wind. Um, so we've been kind of inundated with you know, what, how, how are we going to handle this? So about a year ago, we, uh, I brought to the commissioners the option of putting a moratorium just to put a pause on applications coming into the county um, to give us a chance to develop some kind of uh, regulations for it. It didn't really do anything to stop the process with the BLM, but kind of gave us a chance to make sure we know what we're doing before we start entering into development agreement, negotiations, and that sort of stuff. Um, big concerns we've got in my county is the fact that, you know, we do have water issues here uh, in the Pahrump Valley, as well as the other basin, which covers part of Beatty and Amargosa. Some huge concerns, we've been on some restrictions um, there's been orders issued by uh, EWR over the last few years. Um, the other one is air quality. Um, we've had some issues with that, uh, particularly in the Pahrump Valley, where it is monitored by um, EPA. Um, we've got a lot of chatter back from the OHV community that utilizes a lot of trails that have connectivity between Pahrump Amargosa, Beatty, and all the way up to Tonopah. Um, view shed impacts. Um, you know, the other big one is county and town resource impacts. Um, that being, you know, roads, uh, you know, road remediation issues for all the construction traffic, as well as emergency services. And, um, So we have tried to address a lot of that within the ordinance that I've put together that's currently in the DA's office. I'll share my screen here just to show you kind of what we got going on here. Um, 
right here. I love the. Okay. So, in the, it was quite a challenge actually. Um, I, I researched coast to coast, um, looking for examples of ordinances, um, you know, from the northwest all the way over, you know, to the east coast to try to address a lot of the feedback we were getting. Um, so I did develop an ordinance that does cover preliminary and final development approval, um, permitting, of course, construction standards, development standards, um, setbacks, height restrictions, and then post-construction and maintenance, um, any post-construction modifications, and then uh, one of the things that was mentioned a little bit ago, which is also covered in this ordinance, is the disposal issue, because um, that's a huge concern in Knight County. None of our landfills are permitted to accept this type of waste, um, even on a scale of just the operation and maintenance stage, let alone the decommissioning. So that's very concerning. Um, don't know quite where it's going to go. Um, we're currently in our uh, DA's office review period. Um, and I'm expecting to get my comments back from them, hopefully by this next Friday. But once we have something that, you know, we're going to actually close to moving forward to with the county commissioners, I would be more than happy to share it with anybody who's interested. They're more than welcome to reach out to me. But, you know, like I said, <laughs> there's a there's a lot to be concerned with. And I, I went one step further and we also tried to address wind. Not that we have, I believe, a lot of wind potential from what I've heard in the past, but again, I do know there is one application in process for Knight County, which kind of has a lot of the same uh, similar concerns, even you know, as the uh, the solar it does itself. Uh, Knight County's currently got three solar projects within our jurisdiction. One of them is up in Tonopah, which is uh, solar reserve, and that's more of the reflective system where you've got the tower with the mirrors. It's had a lot of struggles since it uh, was commissioned quite some time ago. We have another uh, solar project out in Amargosa that's in current operation um, that all we've really experienced from there is we do have some air quality issues. There's a lot of dust that blows off of that site. It's very sandy soil, so it doesn't coagulate very well and there's uh, even you know natural vegetation that's came back there it's pretty sparse so it's created some issues as well as there's been some fire events out there with some of the transformers which the fire department in amargosa is not today equipped to combat so it's more or less to just watch it burn and you know until it burns out type issue and then we've got a small solar project in uh, the Pahrump area, which is actually owned and operated by the local utility company here, Valley Electric, which we haven't really had any real issues from there, but it is pretty small on scale. Um, I think it's only about uh, 15 acres. But with what's being um, proposed for the Pahrump Valley, it's several thousand acres tens of thousands of acres. So in doing that, um, in coming up with this ordinance, you know, one of the things that we've got incorporated in here, if it makes it through the DA's office, is the requirement for a development agreement um, to try to address issues. Because we have different, you know, depending on where it's going to be cited, there's different issues that come with it. You know, um, up in Beatty, for instance, they have a lot of concerns with impacts on their tourism because well, that's the majority of their income today, at least until the mines and stuff get up and operational out there. You know, where Pahrump, it's, 
you know, visual impacts along the highway because in Pahrump, we not only have the projects that are proposed to the south of Pahrump, but then at the county line and into Clark County, there's several projects there too, one of them being Yellow Pine, which has been under construction for a little bit of time now. And, you know, the biggest impact we've seen from there is the water that they're using for that site is coming out of the basin that services Pahrump. And it's actually being hauled down the highway and down county roads to that site, you know, uh, several thousand gallons a day. So those are kind of some of the things um, we're going to try to address through this ordinance. Again, it's a 37-page ordinance, but um, duplicate, half of it addresses solar, half of it addresses wind, so it's not as daunting as it seems. But definitely concerning. Um, I'll be more than happy to share everything I learned. Like I said, I've taken some time and paused and tried to make sure I address everything. Um, I'm currently in the process now kind of as a last step is I've circulated our draft out to the townships within the county and um, I'm getting some feedback from some of those town boards to make sure we're trying to cover everything so we have the best document you know to start with I'm sure it'll evolve as we learn more like we have over the past with the few experiences we've had but I'm trying to get a, a very comprehensive ordinance through. Thank you, Brett. Well, it looks like we're down to our last uh, few minutes that we can ask some questions. I have a couple questions that I, I think uh, Supervisor White brought up earlier and, and I'll add my mind to that and can answer. This is for BLM. Our utility scale solar projects or wait, let me go this one. Solar panel and batteries have a lifespan of 20, 30 years for panels, 10 to 15 years for batteries, as well as some, as some potential techno, technological obsolescence. What do you see envisioning happening to the large, large solar component waste stream we are creating? Are there some pretty big hurdles to cost-effective solar panel recycling? I have been in some meetings where we have um, periodic meetings with with the industry, and there are very non-specific, broad conversations about recycling certain components of a solar facility. It seems like it's in its early stage, though. It doesn't seem like it's um, been well, the, the process established or the mechanisms to do it or otherwise, but I think there is something going on with the industry in, in taking that, that issue on. Um, but we we don't we're not hearing anything definitive yet coming out of that process about how about the opportunities for recycling materials or not yet. What about the the alternative solar systems with the mirrors and the salt brine? Where where are we at with disposing of that? Is that salt brine contaminated? Is that a is that a hazard like the solar the ordinary solar panels are? Where, What's the story on that part of the deal? I, I've only very vaguely heard a little bit about that, so I don't have enough knowledge to, to help you out on that question today. Are you guys uh, requiring bonding on the, on the properties? And are you in coordination with the counties to make sure? Because I saw where the administration waived some of the bonding on some, uh, some wind projects up in, I think it was New Jersey. And that would be catastrophic for our counties if it, if it got changed like that? So is it kind of a dual thing that uh, in cooperation with the county? I would have to get back um, on that. I'm sure there's a bounding requirement at the time we issue a notice to proceed that that has to be in place. And it would be across all the type of right-of-way authorizations we have. Um, the only thing that recently happened, which is administration initiative, was to cut the... the um, costs of right-of-ways down. Um, there's a viewpoint that right-of-ways for other non-solar, non-renewable things were disproportionately lower than the, the right-of-way um, yearly costs for solar. 
And so there is there is administration uh, effort, or there, maybe they've completed it now, to cut the the yearly costs for rights of ways for renewables or even them out. I'm not sure what the I don't remember exactly what the concern was, but I I've not heard anything about changing anything about bonding them. Okay, uh, another question is are utility scale solar projects being constructed now constructed now in a way that will allow the landscape to be restored after decommissioning? Or this is another emerging item that's coming up with all these solar projects is, so if we look at the layers here of the issues, right? Dust is the most apparent one, um, but then there's also, when we issue a right of way, it's for 30 years, and then we require the applicant to submit a um, reclamation plan. Now, we do that with the interstate highways and the US highways too. We're never gonna tear them down, but that's just in what we do. We require the, the term of the right of way. And then upon the term of the right of way, there's the option to renew, which is with all rights of ways, but we still require them up front to include a reclamation plan. Well, that's nice 30, 35 years or maybe 60 years down the road to be aware of that, but there's an emerging uh, effort on the part of industry and with the BLM. You may have heard of, seen the articles about Gemini. Um, it's sort of being characterized as the Cadillac of the solar projects, the recent solar development projects, where we're moving, the industry is moving from what I'm going to call clear cut all the vegetation to using certain technologies that allow for the placement of the pylons and the panels, but a retention of a certain amount of the vegetation. So that if that project were to ever be decommissioned, which is theoretical in my opinion, then the reclamation would be easier because there would be a certain percent of vegetation that would be the, you know, from 15 years ago or 30 years ago otherwise. So we have, um, I was looking at the Rough Hat project, which is the one that's currently out for review in the Pahrump area with uh, the comment period on ending on April 8, 8, 11th. And the requirement of the BLM preferred alternative is that there's 60% vegetation cover retained or met two years after construction. So after the work has been done, two years after that, that area, and I don't know how they assess it, it's not a LIDAR exercise. I don't know if it's imagery or what they're using because they variation, there's variations in cover and density, right, across the landscape. But two years after the completion of construction, that project has to achieve 60% veg cover. Um, it's through a mowing exercise, right? They're shortening the vegetation because some things are maybe taller than the panel where the panel is on the pylons or other. The project we have, which is Bonanza, because of uh, being uh, threatened tortoise and the, the movement of the tortoise populations, they call it connectivity. There's a higher level of interest. And so they're looking at, we're looking at 75% vegetation cover two years post construction. So there is a movement nuance between the industry and the BLM of not having a blade and crush and, and removal type of um, project anymore. We're moving away from that. The industry is be ch being challenged because we're getting pushback because they're saying there's only one technology that can lead to this type of allowance of vegetation. To, um, and it's called OG or something like that, OJIA, I think, and I don't even know what that abbreviation stands for, but it's a proprietary technology. We as an agency cannot require an applicant to use pr proprietary technology. So that right now the technology seems to be in its early stage of coming in development to allow for greater retention of vegetation under the panels and around the panels that then ultimately assists with if there were ever to be a decommissioning and reclamation, um, then theoretically then the vegetation state would be in a much better condition and the arguably the vegetation would be rebounding quicker. But the challenge we're running into is the other conversations are, we put out the mandate of two years. What if we have a five-year drought cycle? 
vegetation is not going to come back up to that level in two years if we run into a five-year drought cycle. So again, that's the things that are going back and forth between the BLM and creating these vegetation requirements so that it isn't denuded and it lessens dust to some extent by retaining a certain amount of vegetation. It also assists with the decommissioning and the reclamation if that were to ever happen. But what do we do when we have that element of drought cycles come in and we mandate that within a certain period, it must achieve certain vegetation levels. And then we have a five or eight year drought cycle that comes in that's gonna not allow that for it to happen. So there's lots of things going on in the background um, that I would say a lot of them are still at the early stage. One of the things that, uh, that me personally, I've looked at, uh, on how to retain some water rights on those properties so that if it ever did go back to the way, way it was, how we could, uh, especially stuff that is brought through in a private property, I guess. Um, and that would go toward that because it could retain uh, water rights on the property. So, so if it get, got decommissioned. For uh, revegetation. Yeah. Which is really hard in the desert. It's hard pan soils. It doesn't make it susceptible to easy revegetation, but that would be the other mechanism we would put in there in the conditions of the authorization is if you don't meet that 60% within two years, you must intervene and artificially supplement the vegetation community in that area to get it up to that 60%. But this is sort of on the experimentation side. Gemini, again, it, look at it, look at what they're doing. There's been a lot of articles on it. It's being touted as one of the ways going forward. Not, nor, well, no, in 10 or 15 years, because there's never, you know, it's not, it's not been studied for 10 or 15 years to say, did the tortoise actually sort it out as to how to navigate through that solar array or not? Um, we'll find out. Do you incorporate the study of wildfires and all of that also with the potential of having the growth under these panels and if you get a fire what that fire may react with the panels itself is that part of that there's been some i just one last couple of weeks there's been some interaction of there's a couple sources of literature and about wildfires and solar developments and i can't exactly remember the connection between the two ideas but one of our biologists was looking into that. So there is some kind of interplay and it's something we need to consider. Uh, keeping but, the, the yeah. vegetation under there, you do increase it. Yeah. Sounds like we're rushing forward without a lot of answers. That's what I think too. We have no plan, but we're pushing it through anyway. You talked about the decommission plan. Is there a bond that goes along with that to guarantee that the money's there to do it? Yes. That's there's a bonding requirement for the operations and maintenance, and then the decommissioning is all. I'm not sure if it's one bond or if it's multiple bonds associated with those different activities. So Esmeralda Seven just is because I'm it's more newer in my knowledge set. While there's seven solar projects, what the BLM is contemplating there is that first it's programmatic analysis that's going to then be followed up with project specific analysis. So in other words, each there's seven solar projects that are all encompassed within one environmental assessment, environmental impact statement. Then each one of those individual projects is then gonna cause an environmental in, an assessment to be prepared for each one of those. And one of the things that they're talking about in Battle Mountain is the phasing or the staging of when those authorizations are going to occur. They're not all going to occur at once. Um, and that's the other thing that I think the BLM has to be aware of where there are these clusters of these solar projects is that there has to be some sort of allowance for a phasing or staging over time. Um, one for so the socioeconomic or the community concerns and the workforce and all those things can be considered um, and that's what they're contemplating with Esmeralda 7 is when this EIS gets done, then it'll trigger individual project-specific environmental assessments that'll be back out for public review and more input and more feedback. And then eventually lead to authorization of maybe one or maybe two in the beginning, and maybe the other five aren't going to be authorized for three or five or eight years. They're not all going to get authorized at once. 
Um, and wouldn't the cooperating agency engagement of the county with those individual projects be the opportunity to make sure that the bonding was in place and to see what the actual bonding amount is? Is that when that would happen? Because the BLM, I, I think we've all heard there's bonding and then we've heard sometimes it gets laid. I don't think anyone knows what the bonding is and if it's sufficient and if it's always there. So when is that defined uh, on a project a project basis? It's definitely in the later part of the NEPA process, probably around when the record of decision or decision record is issued is when that's coming together. And again, I, it's probably a condition of the notice to proceed. The notice to proceed is the last thing we do before they break ground is we issue a notice to proceed. And I would think that has to all be in place. There's no requirement for external engagement regarding our bonding process. It's not a public document. It's not a NEPA document. So I don't know whether or not the offices could choose, right? Because we have so much in our portfolio that is discretionary to elect to provide that information to cooperating agencies or not. It's going to be done on a project by project, office by office basis as to whether or not they're open to that sharing of that that item that's more of an internal thing than it is an external thing. I know that there's external implications, but we're not any under any mandatory requirements to, it's just like we get, um, you know, do we release biological assessments and biological opinions for our projects to the public? There's no mandate to do that. It's more of an adopted practice to go ahead and do that. It's, it's a good thing to put out there. And that's gonna be very, by project and by office. Believe me, I've worked in five offices and nobody in the BLM does anything the same across the whole country. And that's why I routinely hear, but over in there, that office, they did it that way. Why aren't you doing it that way? Well, why, why isn't that office doing it the way we're doing it, right? That's what happens in a highly decentralized agency. Oh, we're running out of time here, so yeah. go ahead. To one quick, there were some questions about net proceeds. Yeah, well, I think the answer was already provided. Renewable energy tax abatement it applies to real property and sales and use tax. Okay, so, I have a question for you, real quick, about that. So, here you are, you're taxing these guys and, and you're giving them these abatements and stuff when they're doing the construction, and they have two to three hundred workers and they're making forty to forty five dollars an hour. And they're all running around all these communities and spending all this money when they finish this solar plant or this geothermal plant or whatever then you're down to three to four employees and they're not making that kind of money you're giving a 20-year property tax break on that which has a strong effect on the community because they're not getting all that money that was coming in from all the construction and stuff once the construction is done in four to five years you've still got another 15 years of abatement on property taxes well but you're talking several different in uh, situations here. You're talking about what construction workers would spend and where they spend it, right? right. We don't regulate that. Right. No, that's not what I'm saying. As long as you have the construction crew there, they're getting the sales tax abatement. That's three years. <laughs> no, not the construction crew, the company that's building for the three plant. years. For three years. Okay, but then that entire plant gets property tax rebates for 20 years. Abatement. Yeah, abatement. So they're still not getting the full revenue from this plant. And but like we were talking about the solar plant, the solar panels and stuff are done. This is so, the, essentially, this is economic development for the, the state. But not for the communities. No, if you wait with, there's a choice, though, isn't there? If a facility can go next door into a different county, it is 45% in of the value or the assessment. So, that, so we're weighing 55% of that's still going to cover all the everything that the county is going to end up. Yeah, all the all well, the road tax, all the road work. Well, that's something the and board and of commission we, emergency it, services and has to look at. You know, is is the difference there? And we don't. It's we don't go ahead and say here. Here you go. The board of commissioners in every county is 
It's part of this process. Right. Or Magal or Magal or I can't even say it doesn't have a fire department to go put that fire out, but they've lost property taxes, which could help with the revenue on that for there's, twenty years. There's definitely going to be some and stuff the, that we're going to the, have to work out. The commission does have the opportunity, thirty days to to respond and demonstrate costs in excess of benefits. Which I, I think for for the governor's office maybe is uh, we could give the feedback, but that's kind of a short amount of time to get it before commission and do a uh, economic study. Out, I would think, especially when you look at the timeline, a commission has to go through on agenda items. Open meeting. It would take you two months of that time to get a consultant hired to do the study. <laughs> um, yeah. But anyway, there's a few comments online, and um, uh, uh, I think Andy had her hand raised, so I want to try to at least. Do you mind going over, or are we constrained? We're at 11:30 now. Is I think that... we're okay, unless I mean, is everybody all right with that? And we'll just crowd on. Yeah, yes. if you have to. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let's get all of them out then. So let's see. Uh, want to go to Andy first, or do you? Uh, let me hit the ones that are in the chat. A lot of them were just about recycling. Um, Brett said that uh, Nye County is re is requiring recycling in their ordinance, and they've they're they've been approached by a couple of recyclers. Um, I know that we have, as the um, Brian indicated, we have emerging technology redwood materials is working on recycling batteries. Um, from my own personal knowledge, there's there's some pretty big hurdles to fully recycling panels. You can get the aluminum off and uh, the glass, but the, the circuitry is really, which is the lead and the um, copper and tin and really the valuable part and, and the dangerous part. Um, it's hard to capture that in a cost-effective way from everything I've seen, but I, I, they're working on it. Um, I could bring somebody in. Uh, we're we're just. I just got done. I'm a contractor. My other life, and I just got done doing some wiring on uh, recycling for for solar panels in Silver Springs, and they're almost ready to be up and running. So once they start going, we can kind of see what yeah. what what their cost is and everything else. I know a lot of their stuff right now is because California's uh, started the solar panels a lot sooner than we did. And they're coming through this problem of what to do with them now. So they're shipping them to Nevada to recycle because we're setting up recycling places. And it's in the, I think the, uh, the red tape is a little easier over here than over in California. So we're going to get an influx of seeing if that works or not before we actually need them in the state of Nevada. Hopefully. Another really big issue if we have wind is what you're going to do with those blades. Wyoming is facing that right now. The blades are fiberglass. They're contaminated with oils and all kinds of stuff, and nobody wants them. And that's something that we have to look at, too, is what are we going to do if they actually do do wind farms? What are we going to do with those blades? We'll have that question in Nevada very soon. With yes. Nick Valley. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wyoming that's... is struggling with that right now. The landfills won't take it. What are they going to do with it? Bury it on site. Yeah, can't do that either. It's against me pulling code. <laughs> sure, another one, Jacob. Uh, Brett Brett said that they're requiring bonding in uh, in their ordinance, um, separate from what the BLM does, uh, to be reviewed and updated every th three years to compensate for inflation. Um, Pam commented that if the federal government is going to require X amount of renewable energy, the federal government should require the mandatory recycling of the materials. I think that, you know, like I said, there's technological hurdles there, but I, a lot of the policies, as I, I was speaking with Jimmy about it, a lot of the policies, and as we've talked about, are, over, are ambitious, overly ambitious, and possibly not even possible, uh, but the some of the thinking is that that will drive innovation. Um, but I guess that remains to be seen. Uh, Andy, did you still have a question? You had your hand up and then you took it down. 
Sure, I'll ask my question. Uh, this is for Brett. Um, really appreciate your discussion of the ordinance. I want to go over to the question of uh, air quality that you brought up. Um, that's a real concern with Humboldt County as well. And I'm interested, I know your ordinance is still a work in progress, but on a general level, um, I'm interested to know if you've been looking at um, putting in your code setbacks for um, you know mandatory setbacks from human habitation for solar and um, you know if also you have had with the solar developments you you're dealing with already significant air quality fugitive dust issues. Um, yeah, to answer your first question, we are we do have some setback requirements in there um, to address that. You know, as well as, you know, any, uh, we are also trying to address any noise emitted from there, you know, uh, especially during the construction of the site. But even during operation, I know that the transformers do emit some noise. There's a lot of debate on just how much that is, but we're requiring a study, you know, to be presented to the county, showing exactly what you're going to hear from different distances from the nearest solar panel, you know, to uh, uh, adjacent property line, a non-participating property line. Um, as far as the uh, air quality issues we have had, um, we do get complaints um, for the site out in Amargosa that, you know, has the tendency to have a lot of wind events out there. Um, and we have experienced some here in Pahrump coming off of the Yellow Pine. Now, one of the things I've been, every conversation with BLM or a potential developer has definitely encouraging some other type of abatement methods other than water and something that would be more permanent, you know, especially when they do, uh, when the site goes into operation. You know, uh, some type of dust abatement, uh, palliative, or something that I know BLM on the Yellow Pine project did offer, I, I believe, approved three um, palliatives. I don't believe it's been practiced yet out there. They've been relying on water, but I would definitely try to address in any ordinance that there's something more permanent. That, that'll hold up better, you know, because once somebody drives over it or whatever for maintenance, you know, that palliative or, you know, if it's just water in a crust, is going to be disturbed and you're going to be right back where you started. So, Thanks, Brett. Anybody else online? No, I think we've covered everything. Anybody have anything? I have one more question. How are we going to, or how are you going to address the elephants in the room, which is the sage grouse? ORMAT has to shut down for certain hours of during the day for lecking, and then all these solar generators are going to be making all this noise, and it's going to disturb the birds while they're lecking. And uh, so are you going to make them shut down? How are you going to address the habitat and what's going on with sage grouse, since sage grouse is such a huge issue right now? Um, I will be reading the new revised sage grass plan over the next few weeks um, to better understand what the parameters, requirements, and otherwise are that are being changed. Because I looked at some preliminary information in, in February, um, December, and there's remodeling that's going to possibly change what the different habitat character um, categories are. Um, then we have the allocations where we actually call out things that are avoidance or exclusion. They're looking at some adjustments in those. Um, and then it's all the conditions. There's what we call programmatic design features um, that we try to we call them programmatic because it's not tied to a specific project, but uh, ties to that general type of project. And I'd have to look at those. Um, so you don't have a plan. Well, I mean, no, I, I can speak to a little bit of that. As of right now, in the 2015 plan, solar and winds are excluded from priority habitat. Yeah. 
So you, by rights, cannot develop unless you try to do a plan amendment. Right. Um, and I think for at least solar, general is off limits too. But the new plan that was released today does have some changes in that. Um, personally, Nevada is a big state, right? We don't need to be developing in sage grouse habitat to meet our RPS. Exactly. Yeah. And if we end up with a listed bird, we're going to have a bigger issue on our hands. And that is now we're Section 7 consultation on every project, not only on federal lands, but on private lands as well. So that is one thing that I would urge the renewable energy folks to think about is, you know, everyone's throwing projects and right of ways down. And the, the, the phrase I hear most is, we can mitigate any. That is a really bad way, in my opinion, to approach it for a couple of reasons. Number one, the first part of mitigation is avoid. So you should be avoiding those impacts, which scares me a little bit when we get to the variance process yeah. and the potential elimination of that. And number two, as we've discussed, whether it's, you know, dust, uh, erosion, access, whatever else, some of those impacts are really, really difficult to avoid. And that's what the rural communities that we represent are struggling with, right? On BLM lands, we're going from multiple use to a singular use. So you have that loss in the socioeconomic piece of it. And then you have the abatement piece. And so it really comes down to trying to figure out where the best place on the landscape is for these projects, whether it's because of sage grouse issues or any of the other multiple uses that the rural counties are relying upon now. Right. And then there's your migration patterns for your wildlife, which is a real problem, too. So there are 12 species currently on the potential listing list. Yeah, we have some 12, right? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. We haven't even talked about the big rabbit or not. So by state, by state of sage grouse will be decided this early summer and it will likely be listed as threatened. Greater sage grouse is probably never going to be listed because in 2015, under both Democratic and Republican administrations, there has been an Appropriations Act rider that has precluded the listing of the greater sage grouse. So some of the characterizations of the population at large is it's dropped 40% since like 2000 or something like that. Congress has written in the law that the Fish and Wildlife Service shall not list the greater sage grouse under Democratic Congresses and under Republican Congresses. They're all in agreement. I'm not trying to be political no, no, here, no, no, no. Yeah. but they're all in agreement this bird is not going to get listed. So the challenge we have, right, the administration priority and other factors push the renewables. We are now having to generate plan amendments over the whole state, partly because what I outlined earlier, we have plans going back to the mid-1980s. How we develop, how we conserve, how we use public lands today is not how we use them in the mid-1980s. That's one of the reasons why I got out of being a park ranger, because I didn't actually like the big picture changes and how we use our public lands. We use them much harder today than we ever did in the 1970s and 80s. Rather than having a mini bike or an ATV, we now have a UTV. I mean, the technology, right, has changed. So ideally, what would be great would be we have current planning for the state so that we could explain all the trade-offs we make because it's a hierarchy of like 30 different things. And it may be for this one thing, this particular item is somewhat less, but for this other category, it's higher. And then if I change the situation, then that other factor is back up to being higher and the other factor is being lower. So for me, because I worked as a park ranger and I did a lot of interpretive work, messaging is critical. And one of the things this agency has never done well is message that these are all trade-offs. I may have a project that completely is positive all across the board biologically and then is completely negative all across the board socially. Or I may have a project that is a mix of good and bad for biology and cultural and maybe is a bonanza. So I think one of the challenges I see, because we hear this, is with the renewables, particularly solar, right? There's a high, steep bar on employment during construction and then practically nothing during operations. You would not be having that conversation if this was a 10,000 acre mine, right? 
because that 10,000 acre mine is going to retain probably 50 or 70 percent of that employ employment employee employers jobs and they're going to ultimately live in the community for 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years right so there's a community investment that the mining industry has that I think is the biggest challenge that you all see at the county level is the renewables, mm -hmm. it's a spike, and then maintenance for 30 years and practically no point employment associated with it to where they don't have the connection to the community. And so it's not that mining is all good for everything, right? And that process. It's that there's a relation, different relationship to the community when you're in it for 30 years, because your mind lasts for 30 years versus a solar development where you have a spike and then you mostly are gone, right? Yeah. I think that's the bigger cultural or social challenge going on with this. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, it's, it's a hell of a note, and you can't say this, but I can, that your DC office will not fund an updated state RMP, but they're plowing forward with a single focus on a programmatic EIS mm -hmm. across 11 states. Yeah. And to me, you know, I think that the planning is being done at the wrong level. But that's my personal opinion at this point. And as far as Sage Grouse and Congress goes, I won't hang my hat on anything Congress does for one session. <laughs> but maybe that's just a statement of the office. So, you know, on the, the Nevada statewide RMP, you know, personally, I think we bet too much off. You know, I would have never have recommended that to the state director, but that's me personally. What I mean by that is we have national conservation areas. We have wilderness areas. We have national monuments. And we're trying to create one document under 300 pages now that covers from the general BLM areas to the specialty BLM areas all into one document. And I think those should have been partitioned. So Red Rock Canyon outside of Las Vegas would be lumped into general so uh, middle of Battle Mountain District, which is like miles and hours from anybody, and you know just dispersed cows go through there. Um, so I think and lots of ATVs. I think that the plan. <laughs> I think that I don't know where it's going to go. I just was talking to the contractor working on it yesterday, and they're having difficulty just to getting in the assessment of the management situation completed, which is the first preliminary thing to do. And last I heard was a may scope in 2025. Under 300 pages is a great idea. Under what? Under 300 pages is a great idea. Not, I, in, so. not in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. <laughs> and then it all ends up in a yeah. <laughs> um, Because I think the challenge there is, is that, because I've been on public lands for 34 years. Again, part of it is messaging. And we have to accept that not everybody is going to win. It's offsetting of choices and decisions. And not, not everything comes out like everybody wants because that's the challenge of the public role. I have to listen to a New Yorker just as much as I have to listen to somebody in Utah, in um, Tonopah, because they actually have a perceived equal footing on input to our planning effort a New York resident as somebody who lives in Tonopah. Now, you all would argue against that, but that's the <laughs> format that the NEPA and the obligations we have for public participation. So, you know, my first experience in Carson City on a wild horse gather was to get 12,000 form letters from people in the United States and other countries who believe they had a stake in what we're doing in terms of managing those horses. Um, Anyways, I've enjoyed it. It's the challenge, but I, I just have to come up with the present premise of nothing is going to be perfect, and it, there's no situation where that happens. These are all trade-offs, and they're complicated choices we're making on every project. We've got the same form letters from around the world on our slaughterhouse issue. <laughs> the morning we had that hearing, I woke up with 250 emails in my inbox. Wow. So, so is it, get through yeah, that's that's online. No, I think so. Uh, people have been dropping off. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> it's lunch. I'm just saying, maybe we should start closing this up. Uh, yeah. Our uh, next workshop is tentatively scheduled for June of this year. 
are you asking for input on what type of panelist or uh, anything like that? I'm going to have to check with Vince on that. I just know I was responsible for organizing this one. Because <laughs> <laughs> they brought up issues about uh, taxation. Right. right now. Yeah, they got right. issues of what happened wrong in the state of California mm -hmm. because their panels are coming to an end. Right. But maybe they could share. We get somebody from that side sharing with us. Yeah, there's a number of things I'm, I, I'm sure we could follow up on here. And I did have one one more question for, um, I, guess, I think, BLM and NV Energy, Jimmy, if, if you don't mind. The speculation piece of it, right, we know there's a lot of, of um, entities proposing the projects, looking at all the, the federal incentives, and we're going to decarbonize the entire grid by, by 2035. Um, so that's an opportunity to for um, a variety of entrepreneurs of, of all calibers and scales, right? Um, what, how are how are we curbing that at the BLM level? Or I know that ultimately most of them are looking to sell the energy to the utilities. Um, so I guess for you, Jimmy, at what stage do they enter into a power purchase agreement or? Um, can can we speak to that a little bit as our final note? Speculation, what we could do about it. Yeah, um, yeah, good question. Thanks, Brett. Uh, so I, I think, thanks, Jacob. I think what, what where we are is that um, I think you you hit it, which is a lot of developers, as you can see, for example, Amargosa um, or Esmeralda. There's a lot of speculation going on. Um, what typically happens is they, you know, they, they submit There's a couple of things they do. One is they're trying to do is get site control. And then the other one is try to get the transmission through what's called an LGIA process. So <clears throat> they'll bid in, these are early development projects. Uh, they'll put the information in and then, uh, annually we have the open resource RFP that we do the evaluation. Uh, part of the evaluation is we look at where are they on the NEPA process because they tell us, you know, for example, the, the, the project's going to achieve commercial operation, let's just say in 2027, we'll validate that information to make sure that that's accurate. And ultimately, resource planning will tell us how many megawatts we need. So say, you know, just throwing a number out, if it's 500 megawatts that we need, we'll look for all the different projects that were bid into our open resource RFP and make a determination on which projects are actually viable through a due diligence process. So the ones that are not viable, you know, we, we basically throw them out and say they didn't make the, the cut. The ones that we think are viable, then we try to compare them based on what's called, the, the, like I was saying, is the lowest cost of energy for our customers. So we do that evaluation, um, and then we award the contract to a developer. So a lot of these projects are speculative projects, if I can say, because you know, they're not sure if they're going to get awarded or not. Uh, some of the developers will rebid multiple times on open resource RFPs. A lot of it is it depends on where they can, uh, who's the off taker. So if it's Envy Energy, who's the off taker, they'll be bidding into us. If, it's, if it ties into KISO through the grid lines transmission line, then it's going to be KISO. So it could be utilities in California. Uh, but it's not a sure deal. So I think there's a lot of speculation. The queue, uh, uh, like your friends at the BLM pointed out, it, it's massive, uh, not only on land, but also on the transmission. Uh, but I think, you know, like, for example, there was a FERC order 2023 20, uh, that came out that tried to clean up that queue for transmission so it's not clogged up. So these things where I think if we can make the barrier of entry a little bit more difficult, so there's less speculation on uh, which projects get bid, because ultimately for us, when we have projects that are bidding, we want to make sure that those projects are going to come through. So we, so it's good that we have good projects that are more fully baked in and, and less speculation. I think it helps all of us if we can do that. So hopefully that answers your question, uh, but uh, let me know if there's anything else I can provide. Yeah, and we, we as an agency can only uh, process so many environmental impact statements at any particular office or otherwise. And that's why, you know, the, the Nevada State Office is managing two transmission lines. Of course, they're multi-district transmission lines. So that kind of makes sense. Um, and then 
you know, there have been requests for us to take on more projects at the state office from the districts because we have two items facing our workforce. We're still understaffed. We still are not at 100% capacity in the agency. And the staff that we have is severely underskilled. Maybe it's because I'm almost 60, but we have a lot of young folks in the agency with less than three years of experience. And so that means something that a letter or otherwise it might take me an hour to put together takes them a day and a half and they have to ask somebody else for input. So we are highly dependent on um, contractors to do our NEPA work. And they are all telling me they're turning projects down because they don't have the staff and they don't have the skill set and their staffs. So that may benefit you all because that's <laughs> going to slow down things moving through the queue. Um, and then the reality of working for the federal government. People don't like what we do, so we get sued. And when we get sued, that consumes a great deal of time. It redirects us from working on projects to dealing with the litigation. So there are checks, right? There are appropriate checks of protests and appeals and litigation mechanisms to slow us down. I guess for me, because I've been doing this for so long, I don't think we're speedy Gonzalez. Um, you heard NV Energy say, you know, for a transmission line, they need to expect seven to 10 years for that thing to get through the permitting process. That's not speedy Gonzalez. We're now under a legal obligation to get environmental impact statements done in two years. And some people are hollering and saying that's too fast. I'm not convinced that's too fast because often the siting and the preliminary NEPA work will have taken two or three years in advance of going into NEPA. So both GreenLink West and GreenLink North were about a year and a half to two years before the, app the applications came in in 2020 and we didn't get to NEPA until 2022. And then, then we're under a legal obligation to get the NEPA done now in two years. So that's, if that's fast, that would be four years. I'm not really sure that's fast, um, but that'll all influence, you know, if your county has 15 pending applications, you might only see one authorized in three years. And I indicated earlier, as, as um, he's also indicated, lots of speculation, why did an applicant sit on their application for 14 years and not push the agency to move it forward? Again, you'd have to ask them, but the circumstances seem to be coming into play now where they have interest now that they didn't have 14 years ago. I happen to think the agency should be saying, applicant, if you don't want us to process your application within 30 days or 60 days, like by anteing up a million dollars or whatever for us to do that, then we're going to reject your application. They're trying to hold the land. Hmm? They're trying to hold the land. But mining companies and unpatented mining claims, which there's 400,000 across Nevada, that's been going on for more than 100 years, right? right? <laughs> it's not new. Um, so anyway, so I mean, I think there's only so much that can be put in the pipe and output coming out of the other end. That will be a natural slowing down of these things. It may not be slow enough for some, but the bureaucracy itself is naturally slow. Too slow for others. <laughs> yep. You have anything else? I think we're good. I know we get to appointment. Mm -hmm. so, okay. <laughs> so I do want to remind everybody that's online and in the room, uh, this has been recorded. So if you have to go back and refresh of what was said, and if you didn't write it down, you can come back. Or if you need to give it to someone else in your county yeah. for information, uh, it'll be on the NACA website. Um, I want to thank all the panelists that came for us and everybody that attended. So we're going to bring this to a close. And again, the uh, next tentatively scheduled workshop will be June of this year. And I will send out a follow up uh, email with um, materials and contact information for the panelists um, and certainly reach out if there are follow up questions or we can make connections yeah. between NACO's happy to, happy to facilitate that. Thank you all. Thanks for the present presentations. Good discussion. Maybe NACO needs to bring up. Thank you. Bye bye. It says outside recycled stuff. It's an extra import tax on it.
Sure. So this is going to be 